Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Thanks for joining us. I have the honor of welcoming uh, Admiral Pierre Vandier. He is the chief of the French Navy. Uh, he served in the French Navy for more than 30 years, and he began his role as uh, chief of the French Navy in September of 2020. Prior to that, he served as principal staff officer of the Minister of Armed Forces. His ship commands include, among others, the aircraft carrier Char Charles de Gaulle, and as a student of U.S. and French history, uh, I have to begin by thanking him and the entire French Navy for uh, the Battle of Yorktown in 1781. My children are great fans of the Broadway musical Hamilton, and they now know the, uh, the uh, escapades of the French Navy down at Yorktown against the British, and then French trench warfare tactics which uh, helped uh, the United States become a country back in 1781. So with that, uh, thanks again for the history of our countries. Um, I wanted to begin uh, by first welcoming you, and Thank second, you. by um, asking you to talk about some of the priorities for your visit to Washington, and then I know to Hawaii uh, after this in the context of U.S.-French relations. So over to you, and, and welcome again. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm here for a trip um, in the U.S. I will go, so I'm in Washington for two days and then I will go in Hawaii. Um, it's a good opportunity for us to uh, discuss about the strategy, the Indo-Pac strategy that has been uh, on, on the top priorities of our president. It was discussed after the AUKUS deal. Uh, and so for me, it's very important to, to set things up uh, in this new context. To, uh, to understand what are, are the new uh, goals uh, our two navies have to fulfill and, and how we will prevail in these uh, areas, both in the Atlantic and the Indo Park. That's great. Well, welcome. Thank you. Uh, do you have any other uh, introductory comments you wanted to make as well? Yes, I can give you some, some remarks. Uh, so thank you to give me the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm very happy uh, to and honored to be here. Uh, this presentation has been postponed uh, twice since my appointment as Chief of Navy, but we have managed to uh, recognize, uh, to reorganize it. Uh, as Benjamin Franklin said, uh, energy and persistence uh, conquer all things. So before taking your questions, I wanted to share with you my assessment of the French Navy today. Since the, the end of the Cold War, the French Navy, as much like other Western fleets, suffered from budget cuts until five years ago. During the first 30 years of service in the Navy, basically the majority of my professional life, I've seen the size of the French fleet cut in half. As a result of this downsizing, the French Navy has been continuously under stress, which is good good training for times of war. It has managed to maintain a full spectrum of capabilities, but some have been reduced to a very small scale. Decisions to renew some vessels, aircraft and submarines have been postponed too far in the future, and we will now lack certain naval assets in the coming new years. We are enduring deep format constraints in a wide spectrum of domains. Moreover, facing growing strategic competition and threats to our global interests, the French Navy is deployed in significantly more places than it was designed for in the last defense white paper of 2013. Despite these budget cuts, we never lost our status as a global Navy or ability to act anywhere and at any time, thanks to our permanent commitment to continuous at sea deterrence and the benefits of a high readiness carrier strike group, Charles de Gaulle. Due to these efforts, we have been committed in nearly every international military operation over the last 30 years. Fortunately, the huge effort under undertaken by uh, the law, uh, Loi de Programmation Militaire, uh, which is a multi-annual funding for defense, instigated by President Macron, will give us some freedom to breath but the results for our forces will not occur before 2024 and gaps will not be filled before 2029. 
within the next 20 years, we are to renew a large number of maritime cap capabilities, such as, such as maritime components um, for nuclear deterrence, maritime patrol aircraft, fast attack submarines, offshore patrol vessels, contour mine warfare assets and support ships. Last week, when I have wished uh, all the commanding officers of the French Navy a Happy New Year, I told them that they had to be prepared for high intensity, intensity conflicts and the return on, of naval battles. I think that the new geopolitical cycle we have entered is shaped by the competition for global commons. Actually, sea, cyberspace and space have similar properties that allow sub-threshold encounters and grey zone warfare. Technological competition and fate, fait accompli tactics. Limited by nuclear deterrence, I think that our competitors will prefer using military violence in these global commons that belong to all, are sparsely populated and difficult to control than evading our land-based territories. The oceans are closely linked to the cyberspace and they host uh, data, cab data cables on their seabed and because our sailors use continuously connected data services. The oceans are also linked to space since we use satellites for positioning our assets, for gathering intelligence, communicating and defend ourselves from missiles. Thus, seamen are at the intersection of all the three global commons. We now have to think about warfare from a vertical perspective, from seabed to space, as we discussed with Admiral Gilde, whereas we used to think horizontally from the sea to the shore. Because the oceans have become a privileged place for strategic competition, we are witnessing the proliferation of surface, surface vessels, submarines and naval weapons across the globe. This is the clearest and most worrying illustration of this competition and it gives rise to huge risks of miscalculation. In the meantime, the scope within warfare domains is growing ever, ever wider and new threats have appeared together with new technologies. We must decide, just as our forebears had to do in previous decades, between many possible choices of investments especially because of the high level of technology required to operate in the global commons. One cannot invest heavily in all areas and must do the best across the warfare domains with the financial constraints that are placed upon us. Since we are at the foot of the mountain of the renewal of the fleet, the challenges are huge in terms of capabilities, human resources and interoperability with our allies. The latter is a subject in itself and coalitions of the willing hold the capacity to act as a valuable force multiplier and committed deterrent. To that end, I was very interested by the CNO's NAF plan, which was published in the early January, January 2021, just before I released my own strategic guidance for the French Navy called Mercator 2021, acceleration. Many of the issues are very similar, from capacities to leadership, and we can discuss them if you want. I will try to exchange freely with you to answer your questions when I can, without stepping out of my role as Chief of Navy. Of course, I'm neither, neither a politician nor a diplomat. So thank you and ready for the questions. That's a good thing. <laughs> well, thank you again for coming. I wanted to first uh, uh, turn to the Indo-Pacific, uh, to Asia. Uh, France is, is one of uh, uh, the first, maybe it was the first European country uh, to release a formal strategy for the broader uh, Indo-Pacific. So from your perspective, what role has the French na Navy and do you see uh, the, the French Navy playing in the future as a leading player in the region? Uh, in fact, France inherits uh, huge territories in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific. Uh, the maritime domain of France, the second in the world, is 11 million of, uh, square kilometers, and 60% of it is in, in the indo pac mm -hmm. We have more than 1.6 million of French people living on islands from La Réunion, Mayotte, uh, New, uh, New Caledonia, uh, and um, in, the, um, in, in the Pacific Islands. Um, and so we are committed to 
protect our citizens overseas. And so it's the baseline of, uh, of our Navy design. Uh, we have um, um, sovereignty ships in La Réunion, in New Caledonia, and in Tapet, and they are securing uh, all these EEZs. And um, in, in the past uh, 15 years, we, um, we uh, encountered the, um, the rise of uh, military navies in the area, especially the Chinese one. And so we are committed in the area because we are neighbors, we are, uh, we are uh, in the, um, we have habitants there. And so it's the baseline of our strategy. And then um, on, on this base, we uh, send some uh, dedicated forces from, from France, from Homeland, which cooperate with partners uh, in the area. So we cooperate with uh, the Gulf states, with Indian, and with um, countries in the Far East, as Indonesia, as Malaysia, as Japan. Uh, we, on our um, annual base, uh, we send uh, some forces. We have the Jean d'Arc mission, which is a uh, um, training for uh, cadets. Uh, which goes nearly each year in this area. And so uh, the idea is to uh, make some exercises and to enforce our freedom of navigation. And can you talk a little bit about uh, how you see the U.S.-French cooperation in the Indo-Pacific as well? So uh, we cooperated uh, a lot in the Gulf, uh, in the Gulf area. We send uh, on an annual basis our car to participate to operation in Iraq. And so we, uh, with the Sixth Fleet, we, we, had, um, we, we developed a, a huge um, and a deep uh, interoperability. Uh, and so it's very useful to, um, to try to, to send these um, this, um, this benefits uh, to the eastern part of, um, of the uh, area. We sent last year a submarine, a nuclear submarine that went to Guam uh, and then made of navigation in the, Indian, um, in the uh, Chinese Sea. Uh, and so through the um, uh, quite regular um, uh, deployments we have uh, in, in the Pacific, we do some interoperability exercises. We sent two years ago the carrier up to Singapore and we had uh, some bilateral exercises with the US. Great, yeah, uh, and I think this will probably continue and increase over the next couple of years. One issue that I wanted to highlight was, uh, was that last year President Macron stated that France would cooperate with South Pacific nations to counter Chinese activity, specifically uh, with respect to illegal, unreported, and unregulated fisheries. So part of m my question here is, how, are you, how is France operationalizing cooperation with South Pacific nations to put a check on some of these illegal fishing activities? So from our, uh, our e uh, territories, so from uh, uh, New Caledonia and from Papet, we have uh, some uh, patrol boats, we have some surveillance aircraft, and we use uh, satellites to check and monitor all these illegal fishing. And so we change information with our neighbors uh, and being there acting against blue boats, uh, in fact, helps to secure the area and to put pressure on this illegal fishing. And, uh, and then um, just sh shifting gears a little bit, uh, we'll come back to the Indo-Pacific a, a little bit later, but I wanted to touch briefly on uh, France's now six-month uh, presidency of the EU Council uh, because uh, the uh, uh, com key components of, as we understand, the presidency include the, the strategic compass document, which will be one of the first, if not the first, EU defense white paper or, or something close to that. Uh, France is also committed, we understand, to developing a more coordinated maritime policy. So can you talk a little bit about how you're envisioning this, especially during your period of, uh, of the presidency in the EU? So France tries to um, implicate UE uh, in maritime domain. So uh, you know there, there is EMSA, it's a maritime security agency which is in Lisbon. Uh, which is securing the approaches of uh, Europe. But um, a lot of is um, strategic issues uh, are at sea, especially the uh, sea lines of communications, uh, which are coming from Asia, uh, and we have the Gulf of Guinea issues. Um, we, we, we enforced where, what we call a PMC, it's, um, it's a coordinated maritime presence, um, and so we try to have the, all the operations on, on a um, on in their own initiative, being coordinated, coordinated in deploying their ships 
to secure some very important areas. And so the first area we implemented that is the Gulf of Guinea, where the Italians, the Portuguese, the Danish, um, and the French um, are, are there and to um, make some capacity building with the Africans and um, checking the piracy uh, issues and uh, monitoring the trafficking areas. Today, uh, with the UE presidency, we'll try to um, develop the idea to do the same kind of uh, process in the uh, western part of the Indian Ocean uh, to be able to secure the lanes of communications against um, um, trafficking, drug smuggling, uh, and to be there on a permanent basis to, um, to, to fulfill our security m m missions. And so uh, this um, maritime, um, of this um, uh, coordinated presence missions could help to implicate Europe out of its boundaries. And so it's the aim on the maritime aspect we try to enforce. The other issue is uh, to develop the um, um, environmental uh, issues. Uh, and so um, there, there will be um, next week in Brest, the One Ocean Summit which is driven by President Macron, and which is a side UE, but that will uh, try to commit uh, all the European countries in uh, taking into account the environmental issues at sea in so, the ocean. So what is the role for the French Navy there then? In fact, French Navy has a very interesting model. Uh, it's a, a, a gray Navy, but all these gray ships uh, also participate to uh, Action de l'État en mer, which is civilian missions. In fact, it's a mixed force between coast guards and uh, gray ships. And so all our ships are committed for uh, uh, maritime security missions. For example, our frigates in the Indian Ocean participate to drug uh, uh, smuggling enforcement, or uh, they can track illegal fishing. They are linked with the chain of command, which is related to prime minister, and that is able to give orders to, um, to legally track the trafficking. And so it's a way to be committed on a wide spectrum of missions. That's interesting. Um, we talked about the Gulf of Guinea, the Indian Ocean just now. And I wonder if we could move briefly to the Mediterranean, uh, because the French carrier strike group uh, will be deployed to the Mediterranean in February, almost this month, uh, to conduct operations with partners, including the U.S. So what, what, can you tell us a little bit about the, the, the broader goal? And, and also, as part of that, what kind of a message is this also sending? We've seen, based in Tartus, for example, the Russians are increasingly active in the Eastern Mediterranean. So what's the objective and what are the messages you're also sending to other countries in the region? In fact, uh, you know, the, the bubble, which is around a carrier group, uh, is mostly 500 uh, to 800 miles around the ship. And so you can send Ricky flights, you can say that, uh, some strikes uh, or strike demonstrations. And so uh, it's a way to say that uh, the Med uh, is a very important uh, area for us. And uh, as you know, as you mentioned, uh, on the eastern part, uh, the presence of the Russians with submarines, with frigates, with uh, uh, S-400 uh, batteries uh, may create a sort of um, A to AD area. And so being there, uh, working with Cyprus, with the friends in the area, is a way to deny this and say, okay, uh, it's not a, a closed zone, we, we still can go there. And um, the, the, the assets from the uh, Cairo Strike Group will operate in Black Sea too, to uh, enforce the Montreux Convention and then have some exercises with Turkish inside the Black Sea or with uh, Romanians. Well, I wanted to, to touch base because I noted the recent deployment of the missile frigate in the Black Sea uh, that was well publicized in Russian media, uh, in, in uh, Interfax and RT and Sputnik. Can you talk a little bit about the purpose also of that mission in a little more detail and and, and actually, what your thoughts are on the growing Russian naval buildup in the Black Sea more recently as well. So first, uh, what was the purpose really of that uh, frigate deployment to the Black Sea? In fact, the, the, um, we, we, uh, we go in Black Sea on a regular basis. Uh, and so we, we go four or five times a year. Uh, you know, there is a Montreux Convention, so you, you can't spend a while, uh, too, too, uh, too many weeks inside. So you, when you're in, you count the number of days you then you get out. Uh, the, um, the, we, we put um, focus on it because uh, it 
was the beginning of the crisis with um, Ukraine, and so the shot, the French shot, wanted to show uh, is um, NATO enforcement. And so uh, through this uh, coming inside the, the, the Black Sea, it was a way to say we are alongside NATO and we, are, we participate to the reinsurance effort of all the uh, countries. Uh, the Russians clearly took notice of, uh, of your deployment. Um, any, any thoughts on Russian activities now in the Black Sea? Uh, we're keeping a close eye on satellite imagery of the Russian buildup, including uh, ships in and around Sevastopol, including amphibious landing ships. But be interested if you have any thoughts on what you're seeing as well. I think much of the concern is ashore. Uh, it's uh, land forces, hospital, tanks, and so far. So uh, on, the, um, on, on the naval side, uh, we, we didn't uh, see a, a, a very um, um, a normal pattern of life uh, of the Russians. So they still um, send some ships at sea. On the video uh, that was uh, put on, on Twitter, you can see um, uh, Essen a frigate, which is challenging uh, our frigate. But um, the, the pattern of life of the Russian in the, in the Black Sea is not very different from what, what it used to be before. Yeah, um, uh, the, you're, you're right. The, the primary focus is on the, on the buildup of ground forces and uh, activity at at uh, air bases, which we have been looking at, but have noted some increasing Russian activity in the Black Sea as well. Um, let, me, let me move uh, to a couple of issues regarding um, kind of modern and future warfare. Um, and then I, I know we have some audience questions as well. So the first, the first is, uh, can you talk a little bit about what some of the both aims and outcomes were of your operational exercise, Polaris 21, which uh, aimed in part anyway to help mobilize and synchronize land, air, uh, naval assets. So what were some of the primary lessons you took away from, from that exercise? So the aim of, the, of this exercise was uh, to train our forces for a symmetric engagement, but with not a lot of assets. When uh, we, we train, we used to train with huge blue forces against a limited red force. And the idea was to make this, the, quite the same level of forces uh, and to uh, do uh, six days fights, which is quite a long time uh, in, a, in an exercise with uh, new rules. So when a ship was shot, the ship was going uh, back to the harbor. Uh, the, um, the captains didn't have any more missiles than they had uh, on the ship during six days. So if you shoot, if you have shot all your missiles on the first day, you are out of the exercise. <laughs> so you have to think. And the idea was uh, for commanders to think, to invent and to find some new tactics which, which are related with the weather, with the, uh, with the jamming, with the loss of communication from SATCOM, uh, from uh, the, the, the few missiles they still have left. And so it was to invent the new way of war fighting. And so it, it was very profitable. It showed that first, uh, it's, worth, um, the, um, it's the spirit, which is very important. It's the uh, moral, moral force, the fighting spirit of our forces, which is determinate. Uh, the second point is that um, we, the, um, the, 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 the way to fight and to combine forces is very important, and it goes on not only uh, with using legacy um, um, assets, but it's the combination of space, cyber, uh, information warfare, and legacy uh, assets that make it. For example, um, they had to strike a, a simulated S-400 battery on an island of South, South Toulon, and at the uh, two hours before striking, the red camp, uh, the, the red site, they made a um, refugee camp around uh, the battery. And so we had to recheck everything to, to, um, to have the um, uh, media maneuver to be able to strike this to prove that it was a fake camp and then we were able to strike to make it. So, uh, and so it's a, we, we learned all this combination of real-time information warfare and uh, common channel warfare. So there's, there, there are many aspects of where warfare is headed. One of them, uh, I know that the U.S. Navy and the Marine Corps have been looking at various components of this, and that is the use of um, medium al altitude, long endurance, uh, remotely piloted aircraft or, or unmanned aerial vehicles 
to complement manned maritime uh, aircraft for surveillance. So can you talk for a little bit about how you're thinking about the use of remotely piloted aircraft? And actually, you can add to that if you want the um, uh, submersibles as well, uh, unmanned submersibles. How, how, how are you thinking about that strategically as well as tactically on the, the future of warfare? On the tactical side, uh, when you have a battle group, uh, carrier group, in fact, um, at daylight, you try to understand who is around you. And so you, you try to, to build this uh, situation awareness bubble up to 500 miles. And then the nights arrive. And so the, the size of the bubble reduces. And on the morning, you have to make it again big. Uh, a carrier or frigate moves at 100 kilometers a day. So you may think you are free at the beginning of the night and have the weapons against you in the morning. So the, um, the uh, UAVs help to hold the situation during the night when your pilots have to rest, when uh, you have to repair your conventional aircraft, and then you can keep the bubble uh, still big uh, during the night and so have this uh, superiority in awareness against the enemy. So it's basically the most usefulness of the uh, UAVs. So you described a little bit the use of the UAVs for, um, for aerial surveillance. How are you thinking about the utility of underwater, um, uh, if at all, uh, uh, unmanned uh, surface vessels? So um, in, in a um, fast moving um, um, uh, tactics, uh, the ability of uh, undersea uh, vehicles to follow your maneuver is poor. Uh, I think this, these vehicles are better to uh, prepare something, uh, for example, to monitor the, the, the seabed, to see where you can make uh, an amphibious operation, uh, to make some uh, intel about uh, prepare, pre preparing um, um, a landing somewhere. But uh, if you, the, the energy which is available in uh, these uh, kind of UAVs cannot follow a carrier at that time or, or any submarine. So it's a more uh, local uh, use of UAVs for the moment. Yeah, or could monitor enemy submarine activity if they're moving. At the outside of a harbor or something. Yes, it's, it, right, where they're passing by. Yeah. Yeah, sta stationary uh, yeah. in some cases as well. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit also about um, uh, AUKUS. Uh, certainly there was a crisis uh, that was well publicized in the media, but I wanted to turn to the uh, October where President Biden and Macron sat down and uh, uh, moved on, began to move on at Rome. So how have the French and the U.S. Navy sort of built on that declaration at Rome, and, and where do we see then that component moving forward? So AUKUS was challenging. Uh, I mean, everybody knows that, but where do you see this moving forward now? I, I, I think you have two levels uh, in, uh, in AUKUS. You have the political level, uh, where uh, it's uh, about Aus uh, Australian alignment in the uh, Indo-Pak strategy of the U.S. And then you have the military-to-military -military relations between the U.S. and the French. And uh, these relations have still uh, been very deep because we share a common interest in the Atlantic. Uh, we enforce uh, dual carrier operations. We exchange a lot of information. And, and so um, AUKUS didn't change anything about this level of cooperation. The, um, so it's a good opportunity being, being here to, to discuss again uh, and to implement uh, the consequences of AUKUS in the uh, strategy and the way we will train in the future. Uh, it's what we discussed with Amiral Gilday. Um, basically, I don't think it will change a lot uh, in our day-to-day -day, uh, commitments in the area because we already do a lot and we will still do a lot. So one area that's been discussed is this uh, U.S. and French commitment to a plug-and-fight approach, what some have called a plug-and-fight approach, which to better integrate the two navies. Um, and from your perspective, what are, what are some of the important components of that exchange of data, including potentially classified data, uh, joint modernization efforts? What are key components of that? So um, I think we are in a new arms race. And so all of us are developing some new weapon systems, uh, some new communication systems. Uh, we, we rely more on uh, satellites, on uh, huge um, 
bunch of data which are exchanged between the, um, the forces. And so the issue is to, to still be able to be interoperable. So uh, to be interoperable, it needs to have the same standards for cipher, for, um, for crypto, uh, and to be able to connect our forces all the time. And so it's what we are working on. So I think it's the core uh, of it. It's to be able to ch exchange huge amounts of data very quickly to uh, feed our uh, combat systems and, and to um, have a common understanding of, of the uh, situation. So how big of a challenge, though, is it in, in the European theater, the Atlantic, Mediterranean, anything under uh, a NATO auspices, or at the very least involving European countries there, there are systems even under NATO to be able to share information pretty quickly uh, between European countries or even within EU auspices. But the Indo-Pacific do not have the same kind of ability to share information. That includes off of F-35s or off of aircraft. So how, how are we, how, how do we have more interoperability without some of that kind of a framework with the French, the British operating in the Indo-Pacific, the Americans, the Japanese, Australians, South Koreans. There's not a framework right now. It's a little ad hoc. Is, is this likely to remain an, an issue for the foreseeable future, or is part of what you're talking about a way to start yeah. to fix that? You have um, uh, what, what's called IPMCC, yeah. which is a network where, which, which will have to build an interoperability between us. Um, I, I do really think that the U.S. have an important uh, responsibility in developing this interoperability. They have the highest standards in technology. Uh, the other countries are uh, working uh, behind. And so I think uh, if we want to be interoperable um, in future operations, uh, as the U.S. did <coughs> during the Cold War, I think they, get, they need to help the other countries to be able to connect and to fight in, a, in a cooperative engagement capabilities. Yeah, and I think this will be a challenge um, uh, in the foreseeable future with so many of us operating in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, I want to turn just briefly uh, to, and we've got a couple of audience questions, to um, there has certainly been a focus in this broader vein of maritime domain awareness uh, between state and commercial actors. How do, you, how, how do you think about maritime domain awareness and, and what does that actually mean to you? And how, how are you working through that? It's a huge issue because um, as, as the, uh, most of the commercial activities is now reported through IIS. Um, in fact, you can monitor a lot of things, find some discrepancies and try to find the interesting activities in the middle of the, the noise. Uh, and so building some systems which uh, enable the countries, uh, for example, in the Gulf of Guinea, to understand what kind of, of uh, sea shipping is, is working, what, what are, where are the traffickings, where are the uh, illegal fishing, is something which is strategic. And all of the gray zone operations try to, to infiltrate through this uh, maritime do domain awareness issues. So it's a, a really a strategic issue, and we are working on systems uh, which are able to, to, to search in this uh, huge amount of data, which is abnormal, and where we, we have to, to send assets to, to have a look. Well, one of the, on the, the gray zone uh, issue, it was interesting to see that the response, by the way, off the coast of Ireland, where those transatlantic cables uh, are located that, that uh, move between fiber optic networks that move between Europe and, the, uh, and North America, that the response to the, the Russian uh, maritime vessels that were patrolling around those cables actually came from Irish fishermen. So this is, there's a, 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 a funny historical gray zone parallel to the Chinese um, fishermen operating in the, uh, in the South China Sea in yeah. particular. Um, I, uh, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, we have a French law student who's asking um, what capabilities could be, could be added to better protect French overseas territories, particularly in the Pacific, moving forward. You talked about this a little bit, but I wanted to give you the chance um, uh, to talk, if you wanted, about future capabilities to protect the French. So at that time, we are renewing uh, patrol boats. So a new class of patrol boats uh, for overseas territories um, is under construction. The first uh, of a, a series of six ships um, is, um, has been put at sea uh, this year, and will, she will join uh, New Caledonia at the end of the year. 
Uh, we renew our surveillance um, uh, aircraft with the Falcon 2000 uh, aircraft. The first of it will arrive in 2025. Um, and we use um, new satellites uh, with a startup uh, which is able to make the difference between IAS and radar. radar. And so uh, these uh, kind of satellites, they can find discrepancies between radars and IAS. And so it's very useful to monitor gray zone operations. Can you talk a little bit about um, uh, so much of what people often focus on is conventional aspects of the Navy and Navy operation. What are your concerns moving forward about uh, ad adversary activity in the gray zone? What, what are the areas that are potentially going to be the most challenging, and how, how, how do you counter those gray, gray zone activities? A, a good example of that is what ha is happening on the uh, western part of the Indian Ocean. You have a huge um, drug smuggling highway coming from the northern part of the Indian Ocean from the uh, Pakistanis or uh, uh, the Pakistanis coast, and which is or Iran, uh, Iran coast, and which is uh, drifting, uh, was driving huge amounts of drugs and weapons along the eastern part of, um, of the uh, Af of Africa, and so we are committed to to check all this trafficking. Uh, we, we this year, French Navy caught 50 tons of drugs. Uh, on, uh, on, on ships, both on the Atlantic and the uh, Indian Oceans. And we discussed with the um, naval navies about this trafficking. Uh, it goes uh, in Maldives, uh, and goes in Seychelles, and goes in Madagascar, uh, and it's providing a huge um, instability uh, in these countries. And so it's a good example of gray zone uh, operations uh, where we, we try to track it, track it and put pressure on it. Because we know it's the beginning of something else. Yeah, yeah. Especially the movement of, of weapons. We've even been monitoring the uh, technology that has moved from various locations to the Houthis in Yemen. That has included ballistic missile capabilities, some of the the drones. And this this, this actually raises. We we talked a little bit about the unmanned area, the UAVs uh, that you use. To what degree are you concerned about, or do you see? Um, uh, UAVs being used against you for ISR, for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, or even for strike. And the, the reason I, I raise this is uh, we're, we're there in terms of uh, UAVs that were an important part of the Azerbaijan-Armenian War. Uh, we've seen them target leaders in Iraq and Venezuela. Uh, we've seen them uh, conduct attacks against uh, French and U.S. and British uh, land bases. How big of a concern is it uh, for you? And, and, and obviously, even the, the U.S. during the crisis with uh, the Iranians in 2020, uh, the U.S. shot down uh, an Iranian UAV, and the Iranians uh, did as well with a, with, with a uh, U.S. Global Hawk. So are, are you seeing a proliferation of UAVs, and how does that affect the, the French Navy? So uh, really, we, we are uh, on this subject. Um, it depends if you consider coastal uh, operations or uh, 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 high sea operations. Finding a, a, a ship uh, which is uh, 200 miles off the coast with a UAV is something which is difficult and not affordable for more, or, or most of the countries. But that may happen in, in the next decade. So we are looking for that. You have a lot of means to hamper uh, a UAV. You can jam the remote link. You can. Um, they dazzle the, the eye of the, uh, uh, of the drone. You can use some energy, direct energy weapons. You can destroy it. So um, we are working on that to find the proper uh, effect we need to uh, develop. Um, the idea is not to shoot a one million missile on, on a $100,000 uh, drone. And so it's a sort of um, a financial war to find the, the good weapon for, for, the, for the good um, the good target. Well, this is the challenge the Saudis have had, which is using a, uh, using a one to three million dollar uh, Patriot uh, munition to strike down. I mean, in some cases, a land attack cruise missile maybe, but for a drone, that's an expensive trade-off. I remarked that uh, uh, drones have been used only on land targets at that time, so it's very easy to target a fixed target. 
Um, so land bases, aircraft uh, in their hangars, it's something quite easy to achieve. It's much more difficult to find a force because it moves so fast. I, I told you it's a 1,000 kilometers a day. So if you want to target, you need to have a killing chain, which is quite uh, something complex to acquire. So if it's shore-based, uh, if you have ships along the, the coast, it's easy. In choke points, for example, if you cross Babel Mandeb, it's quite easy to send a drone, uh, whether surface or air drone. But if you are in the middle of the Gulf of Aden, it's much more difficult to target your so it depends on, on the uh, context of the uh, deployment of the seas, of the ships. So we are much more concerned in, um, in choke points uh, to develop some specific uh, tactics and weapons for this, uh, these areas. But really, uh, for the next five, ten years, I don't think we will uh, be at, uh, at risk with drones in high seas. Mm. That, that, makes, uh, that makes sense. We're almost done. Um, we have two last questions from the audience. The first one is, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a positive future-looking question, uh, but it does highlight some of the debates going on among the transatlantic allies on Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so this person says, you know, President Macron said recently, it is good that Europeans and the United States coordinate, but it is necessary that Europeans conduct their own dialogue through the European Union. There have been some challenges with the uh, Germany prohibiting Estonia from exporting the D-30 howitzers to Ukraine. So I, I'm just wondering, uh, just wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about the importance of the transatlantic relationship and even uh, despite some of the differences of views recently, how, how important in, in your view, in, including of the naval component, that transatlantic relationship is? For the French Navy, uh, NATO is the first engagement it's where we have the most uh, naval officers in headquarters. Uh, it's the, the, the biggest effort we do in participating to NATO forces, NATO exercises. So uh, really, it's important. It gives the, uh, um, the insurance that the US are in for uh, major security issues. Uh, and so for us, it's very important. What President Macron tries to do uh, on the same on, uh, on the same time, is to develop um, a, defense, a defense spirit within the European countries to uh, make them t take in account all the security issues and not re only rely on a uh, foreign partner to protect themselves. And as we know, as the commitments are getting higher and higher, uh, higher and higher, sorry, uh, because of China, because of uh, what's going on uh, in all the rest of the world. I think everybody will agree with the fact that it's necessary for the Europeans to make more in their own defense. Uh, that I think that makes a lot of sense, and I think it uh, for anybody that has followed the establishment of the European Coal and Steel Community, the European Community, the European Union, uh, that back and forth has been there for years, and I think it's, it's important. Um, the last question is really a future-oriented or question. Someone, uh, uh, one of our watchers asks, what future large capital uh, acquisitions, new types of ships or new types of submarines or aircraft do you envision for the French Navy and, and why? How, how do you see, in, a little bit in the long term, kind of big, big ticket items? What does that look like? So <clears throat> for the next decades, we are uh, renewing our uh, uh, carrier. So the, the next carrier will be uh, at sea on 2037. Uh, it will be an um, 80,000 tons aircraft carrier with Imal's catapults, with two nuclear uh, plants aboard. Uh, we will renew our uh, submarine, uh, deterrent submarine uh, at that time. We are renewing our uh, SSNs at that time. So uh, the, the French Navy that will be uh, at sea in 2035 will be completely renewed from the one which is now. Um, if we go further in the future, uh, we know that we will have more drones. Uh, we, will have, um, we will have more um, um, a panel of, of armaments that will be uh, uh, wider. Uh, we spoke of drones, uh, so we need uh, uh, different types of weapons uh, to deal with different uh, types of uh, threats. And we will be more connected uh, and uh, we will act as a, a, a multi-component linked with the others. So we will, we will need uh, to uh, high-speed communications with everybody.
and we have our partners. Well, uh, thank you very much uh, for your eloquent responses to a range of different questions from the Chinese and Russians to the future of warfare. We really appreciate you, Admiral, uh, joining us today. And on behalf of the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, thank, for th thank you for talking about uh, France, the Navy, uh, and the future of warfare. And, and also, thank you to the uh, French Navy in general for helping the United States in its earliest beginning uh, start out as a country. So appreciate you joining us. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for all these great, great questions. Great. Well, come back. Sure, sure.